thank you. And I am truly grateful for the opportunity to speak to you today. Can I be heard well in the back or no? Can you hear me? So if there's a problem at any point, please raise your hand. Uh, I would not like to speak only for my own benefit. <laughs> so I will begin by telling you a story that really starts from when I was your age. Uh, and you may find it interesting in relation to your own current activity and your future plans. Uh, after that, I can speak to you, if time permits, about related subjects, such as the importance of fundamental science and the reward, the personal reward that one gains from its study. And also, if you like, and again if time permits, uh, some remarkable examples of its application to the most pressing issues in the world today. I grew up in a scientific family. Both of my parents were scientists. And as a result, I never studied science until I went to university. So in a way, I had an ideal beginning because I had a kind of uh, introduction and apprenticeship without any requirement to study. On the other hand, even, even later in life, there were still extraordinary gaps in my knowledge. But in fact, I think that it illustrates the point, uh, knowledge doesn't really matter. Uh, it is something different that is important, and I hope I can convey that uh, when I tell you this very personal story. So when I was uh, a bit younger than you, and also at your age, as I have mentioned, not only did I not study science, I really didn't study anything. Uh, school was boring, and I lived in a different time from you, and a different time even from what is true today in the United States for my own children. It was a time when I could never do homework. <laughs> I, I avoided telling my children until they were much older. I never once turned in a homework assignment in my entire life through grade school, through high school, through the university. Now that had certain benefits, but it also came at a certain cost. Uh, the reason why I could do that was in that day, one was only judged by results on examinations. Uh, it is different from today when most of the grade in an American school actually depends on the results of one's homework assignment. But it had for me an enormous advantage because I could spend all my time doing other things. And I spent most of my time reading and playing music. Uh, in that day, uh, classical music was much more important than popular music. And uh, I had a brother very gifted uh, in a performance of classical music. He eventually went to the Juilliard School of Music. And the only reason that he did not become a concert cellist is because in the middle of his own study at the Juilliard School, under the leading cellist of the time, another young person appeared in the school named Yo-Yo Ma. And after Yo-Yo uh, began at the school, all the other students of cello had to find another career. Uh, my brother found a career in science, but you understand that uh, I grew up in circumstances where music was strongly encouraged, where I had a brother only two years younger with whom I could not even compete in music, but I tried. He played cello, I played violin, and I played and practiced for my own pleasure several hours a day, every day, until I was perhaps 40 years old. I also love to read. And that is the reason why, when I went to college, I chose as a major subject English literature. And so I was an undergraduate at Harvard College. And for years, I studied primarily English literature. 
Of course, an American education also encourages, even requires, study of a broad range of subjects. So I did, in university, study some science. I studied, of course, mathematics, which I enjoyed, and physics and chemistry. And those were my main interests outside of literature, especially mathematics. And towards the end of my undergraduate career, I could begin also studying mathematics at the graduate level, uh, which served me very well. And uh, your extraordinary principal uh, perfectly understands why I gained great benefit from the study of mathematics, not necessarily because I could always apply everything I knew from real analysis, from complex analysis, to my eventual work on uh, the structure of molecules related to life science, but because there is also an approach, a culture, a kind of rigor, uh, and also a beauty of the outcome which one acquires from the study of mathematics. At any event, uh, I uh, continued almost to the end of my undergraduate career studying English literature. And then, for reasons that I cannot explain, one day in my last year, uh, I woke up with the idea or even the determination that I would go to graduate school in chemistry. I can't explain why, except to say that it illustrates something that I believe is very important, which is to do whatever you feel uh, you must, not whatever you think for some logical reason is the right choice for uh, your next step in life. Now, I wasn't well prepared in chemistry. I applied uh, for gra to, to graduate school. Uh, I was fortunate to be admitted to the Department of Chemistry at Stanford. Uh, the problem was every, ed uh, every student admitted there was required to take a series of entrance examinations in all areas of chemistry, in analytical chemistry, in organic chemistry, in physical chemistry. Uh, and about half of the entrants, those admitted to graduate school, failed those examinations and were sent home. So admission to the, for graduate study at the Department of Chemistry at Stanford was not a guarantee of any further step in life. Well, I passed three of the examinations, but I failed one of them. And you may imagine how anxious I was. You had, you were offered, if you failed one of the four, another chance. And I wouldn't be here today, probably, if I hadn't succeeded uh, the next time around. Uh, and then I went uh, to uh, the next stage of one's graduate career uh, was the acceptance into the research group of a professor in order to pursue graduate study, uh, one day to write a PhD thesis, and to receive the calling card of a scientist, the certification of PhD. Well, I'll tell you more about that later, but at any event, I chose a professor. Uh, I think he was the greatest physical chemist of the last half of the 20th century. You would not know his name because he did not win a great prize, but he certainly deserved it. Uh, possibly he didn't win the prize because uh, he was a very private person, didn't like to speak about his work or even to interact with other people, but did extraordinary work. He really wrote the theory, discovered the basis for nuclear magnetic resonance, which many of you will know of, for electron paramagnetic resonance. Uh, and his contributions uh, went even beyond that. I decided I would like to study with him because he was obviously a fine mathematician and theoretician, and I much admired what he did. Well, I went to see him, and he told me it was impossible. He would not accept me as a student. And uh, I would not take 
no for an answer, and I went back to see him again, and he refused again, and I could tell you what were some of the reasons, but it doesn't matter. Finally, he accepted me. He told me that if I would write a proposal for research, and he agreed it was worthwhile, that he would allow me to perform graduate study with him. Well, of course, I didn't know much about any problem at that time, so it wasn't obvious how to write a proposal. But I thought it should be about the use of magnetic resonance to solve an important problem. So I said, I wrote a proposal for the use of magnetic resonance to study a fundamental question about biological membranes, the question of how are ions, sodium ion, potassium ion, other salts, transported from one side to the other. Ions cannot diffuse freely through a membrane because it has an oily interior, and everyone knows salt doesn't dissolve in oil, but only in water. Uh, I wrote that proposal. Now, he did, fortunately, he was a theoretical chemist, and he didn't know any better either. So because he couldn't uh, see the flaw of my proposal, then he accepted me. Well, the problem was that it was impossible. You couldn't really solve the problem that way, but he didn't know, and I didn't know. I worked for three years, and now, unlike the time when I would not do homework and all that was required, I was confronting uh, a challenge of a different kind. Instead of being asked to memorize something that was already known, I was suddenly in a different world of seeking to discover new knowledge. And that was stimulating. And I stopped reading. I stopped for a while playing music. And I worked harder than I have ever done in my life. I worked two eight-hour days. I would work from 9 to 5, and then from 8 in the evening until 4 in the morning. Every day, seven days a week. And I did that for three years. And at the end of that time, I had nothing to show for my effort because it was impossible. And I couldn't solve that problem. Now, you've heard that, and I have mentioned that my father was a scientist, a very wise man, uh, not only a great scientist, but the wisest man I have ever known. And he didn't involve himself in my work. For many reasons, he was a father, but not a fellow scientist. It was very important, as I could tell you later. Actually, I want to keep track of the time. How much time do we have? Because I want to tell you a bit about my life, but I want to have a discussion with you. It, to me, it's very important that this not be a monologue. I want to have you ask me questions and let me respond and have a conversation. But I'll go on for a few more minutes. Say again. Uh, so I have to be quick. Uh, so I will not go on too long. Well, at any event, my father asked me after three years one day, he said, you know, how are you doing? And I told him that I had worked very hard and I had accomplished nothing. And he said, well, w w how do you feel about that? And I looked at him like I didn't understand the question. I said, what do you mean? I said, I'm going to discover something. And he said, that's all that matters. And I can give you other reasons why I realized, looking back, the wisdom of that remark. I was sure I would discover something someday. I just didn't know what it would be or when it would be. And I realize now that that approach is absolutely essential, that if you have the belief in yourself, the confidence that it will finally happen someday, someday, some way, it will take place. Well, at any event, very soon after that, I had a better idea than what I was trying to do. Instead of trying to understand how a very large molecule, like a protein, which could be 100,000 molecular weight, why not ask the same question about small molecule, only 1,000 molecular weight, and in particular, one of the constituent molecules of every 
cell membrane, what is called a phospholipid. Some of you will know that the fundamental structure of membranes is based upon a double layer of phospholipid molecule. Well, you would be surprised that at the time, some 50 or more years ago when I was a graduate student, the structure of biological membranes was still unknown. It was suspected that a double layer of lipids played an important role. I asked the question, does a molecule in one layer pass to the other layer? And in parallel, you might ask, can a molecule in one layer move from one place to another? I could answer those questions by magnetic resonance. I found that a molecule never passes from one side to the other, a process which I named flip-flop because of the obvious relationship, but really because I'd been studying in physics in the university about an aspect that was referred to as flip-flop, but that's beside the point. It was a fundamental finding that is today recorded in every textbook. And then I found, again using magnetic resonance methods, that a molecule in one layer would move rapidly within a process that I named lateral diffusion. And these two findings uh, represent a foundation of membrane biology and have proved to be fundamental to uh, all of what we know about cell membrane transactions today. Well, after that, I decided uh, that I would do postdoctoral study to acquire knowledge of the other important method besides magnetic resonance for elucidation, for the uh, understanding of life processes, namely X-ray diffraction, a way of uh, determining the atomic structure of molecules, including protein molecules. And the uh, uh, the science, the field of X-ray diffraction of biological molecules had just been invented a few years before by people in Cambridge, England. Uh, the Nobel Prize was given to John Kendrew and Max Perutz for founding that subject. They determined the atomic structure of the blood proteins, the gas-carrying, the oxygen-carrying proteins, hemoglobin, and myoglobin. So I asked to be allowed to be accepted for postdoctoral study there. I arrived in England. The same thing happened in a different way. I went to my supervisor, uh, the person who had accepted me, a man named Aaron Klug, who later won a Nobel Prize for his work along these lines, also a very fine theoretician and mathematician. And uh, he suggested a variety of topics. And I didn't think any of them were interesting. And then uh, a friend of mine pointed, me to s pointed out to me a recent paper by a man named Francis Crick. You may have heard of the Watson-Crick structure of DNA. Francis Crick was still active in the laboratory. He had just published a paper on an outstanding problem in all of structural study of life the structure of chromosomes. I read his paper. I didn't realize at the time, and you can find it in Nature magazine, 1971. You don't know about it. No one does because everything in the paper is wrong. The great Francis Crick made every possible mistake in that paper. But it doesn't matter because, from my standpoint, I was inspired by reading it to study the structure of chromosomes. As it happens, this is a problem that had been pursued for almost a century, ever since German chemists discovered the composition of chromosomes. They found chromosomes were made of equal weights of DNA and a set of small proteins that are called histone. Well, people had studied this problem for a long time, and when I got interested, there were many research groups around the world who devoted all of their efforts to this problem of discovering the structure of chromosomes. 
I decided I would study this question, and I worked very hard for a year, and I made no progress. But then I was very fortunate, and I realized one day why people had failed for so long, and what was the impediment. I realized that the thousands of papers that had been published all served no purpose because they had studied the material in an altered, uh, what we call a denatured form. And I realized that if I did the same thing over again on material where the original structure was preserved, I might make uh, some important contribution. Indeed, within a matter of a few weeks, I had solved the problem and I had discovered the basis for the structure of all chromosomes in so-called eukaryote organisms. And uh, that is the most important work I ever did. And uh, as uh, Mr. Wu has said to you earlier, alluded to the fact, I did that when I was about 25 years old, and I can tell you that I could not have done it today, not because I wouldn't be uh, armed with the same information, but I would not have conceived of the solution of the problem because I would know it couldn't be right. But then I didn't have enough information to reject my idea, and it proved to be the solution of the problem. That is one of the reasons why young people like you have the possibility to be original, to discover something. Whereas, sad to say, I will never discover anything again in my life, even though I keep trying, I might add. Now, uh, I won't go on much longer. Uh, just to say that uh, after I completed that work, then I was interested in the function of the structure. Why does it take the form that it does? And I spent the rest of my career pursuing that question. Of course, the most important function of chromosomes is the information which resides there to direct the formation and the function of every living thing in every aspect, in every tissue and what have you. And so that was the subject of all of the rest of my life. It took a lot longer because it is so extraordinarily complicated and it is not yet done. Uh, the work that we did eventually led uh, to a Nobel Prize, and it was one aspect of the work in particular. That is the determination of the atomic structure of the very, very large assembly of many proteins that is responsible for reading the genetic information. And those of you who have studied biology will know that is a molecule called, or an assembly of molecules called RNA polymerase, and actually not limited to that molecule, but an object that is even five times larger because there are many other participants in the process. And understanding how all of that works is still a challenge. There's wonderful work being done in laboratories in China at the moment, um, excellent research groups who've actually done recent work that uh, was, uh, I would say, uh, better than our own recent efforts on the problem. So what I have told you is a, a story that might surprise you in some ways. Uh, as I say, a, a story of really something different than what you might imagine is important for success uh, for a career in science. Uh, I've told you that it isn't that knowledge is not the most important thing. Uh, belief in yourself is what really matters. And the reward is not something tangible. The reward is something that you can only gain through the moment of discovery. And uh, there's no better way to explain that to you than to perhaps try and convey the difference between that moment when I realized the flaw and discovered the structure of chromosomes, the difference between that moment and when I got a telephone call in the middle of one night to inform me I had won the Nobel Prize. I actually 
had no strong reaction in that moment. Nothing to compare with the euphoria, almost a hallucinatory euphoria, when I realized in one instant the solution to the structure of chromosomes. Uh, it's, it, it, it made living worthwhile. It was the most important thing that ever happened to me. It was so extraordinary. There's no other way to explain it. Uh, my father once said, uh, science is not fun, it's rewarding. And what he meant by that was the personal satisfaction that you may gain every once in a while, if you're lucky. I wanted to come back to the, to the point about psychology and how much it matters. I've mentioned it twice. And I always tell my children and I tell other young people about the importance of psychology, your belief in yourself, what you think can be done. If you don't believe deeply that you can solve something, you never will. But if you do believe that, you can take on a seemingly impossible task and achieve it. And I always give them the example of the four-minute mile. Now, you're too old to know this, too young to know this, but I'm old enough to remember, and I even met the man who did it. So for decades, through the beginning of the 20th century, many people tried, but no one could run one mile in less than four minutes. And it was believed to be beyond the limit of human capability. And then one day, I think in 1947, 48, around that time, an English medical student named Roger Bannister ran a mile in three minutes and 59 seconds. It was heralded as, heralded as a, uh, one of the greatest achievements in athletics at the time. I met Roger Bannister many, many years later. He became a physician. And I met him at Oxford University uh, at a dinner one evening. And uh, he was even an imposing figure then. The point is, a few months after he did, another person did. And then another person did. Once he had shown it was possible, then it became easy for others. And they all ran miles in less than four minutes. The power of psychology. You may think that science is just all about numbers and information and logic. But in fact, the story I've told you about my own experience really is especially about psychology. It's about tackling bold question, difficult questions, things, things you don't believe you can solve. And sometimes, if you are certain that you can do it someday, some way, it will happen. I often say to my students who propose to study something which is quite straightforward, you know, why bother to do that? Because you know you can do it. You should study something that you're afraid of. You're not sure you can do it, but which, if you could, would make a big difference to our understanding and to the advance of science. In order to do that, they must be convinced themselves. They must believe they have the capacity to do so. I would like, it's now 519, and I really want to stop and take any questions that you have. Anything you would like to ask about any aspect, please, and thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for your wonderful talk uh, in the field of life career and uh, science and many aspects. Do you have any questions, please, freely to move your, to raise your hand. Yes. Thank you, Professor Kornberger. Uh, I am a full-time teacher in this high school, and today I have two questions about education in high school. So in China, most students work exceptionally hard. Most parents are willing to fully support their kids' education. Many Chinese schools have a very competitive faculty, uh, faculty team. For example, our school has more than 100 PhDs working as a full-time teacher. Therefore, Chinese students have, uh, have excellent scores in most exams. 
After K-12 education, many Chinese students who graduate from the best Chinese high schools and colleges, they choose to uh, went to American universities for higher education. However, either from my personal experience or from statistics reports, Chinese students don't make exceptionally better academic achievements comparing to their high schools in exams than their classmates in the universities, as well as in their following academic and industry careers. So my question is, the first question is, why did this happen? And the second is, what should we do in the aspect of high school teachers to improve this situation? Thank you. So the first thing, <laughs> the first thing I would tell you is that I have had many members of my laboratory uh, who came uh, to the United States following an education in China. Uh, and they were among the most talented that have ever worked with me over the years. So I don't agree that they do not uh, do extraordinary work and do not possess great ability. All of them are now professors at American universities. And they are, in many cases, among the finest professors in the universities where they are currently employed. So uh, please don't believe that there is anything uh, that they lack or that they suffer from uh, that is uh, an impediment uh, to their eventual success. But still, uh, you raise interesting questions. Um, I mean, I'm a great believer in the time I had to dream, uh, to imagine, to do different things, not to focus all the time on study and the acquisition of knowledge. And I've tried very hard to persuade professors at Stanford not to teach the way they do. Because I've told them that I have spoken to their students. Uh, this is in both biology and in chemistry. Uh, and I'm sure the same would be true in physics, although I haven't done so. And almost every one of them has told me, we arrived at the university to pursue a career in biology or to pursue a career in chemistry, and after one year, we we're looking for something else to do. And what was the reason? Because they were so unhappy with the coursework. Now, I found out more. It was very difficult, and they were asked to study and to learn an enormous body of material. And they lost interest in the subject. So I've tried to convince my fellow professors it doesn't make any difference if they learn one fact. All that matters is at the end of the year of study, they're more interested in the subject than they were at the beginning. Because if they're really interested, if you've, if you've encouraged them to be interested, then they will go on and they will learn facts. And not only that, but anything they learn, they will remember because they were interested. And everything you've taught them, they will forget because they really didn't care to know or remember. I have not been very successful in that. Uh, it's an approach which still has not been adopted. But that is the way I believe one should teach. I think the important thing is to encourage a continuing or even greater interest so that whoever learns from you will be inspired and go on. So I, I repeat, I think Chinese students do superbly well. And I think the training they get cannot be improved upon. I do think that uh, wherever possible, and I realize it's more difficult nowadays, but nevertheless worth considering, they should have the opportunity to learn less and reflect more, to uh, perhaps learn less, but explore uh, and use more imagination than, as it were, uh, ability to store information. That's all I can say. So any more questions? I think opportunities should be given to students. Hello, uh, Professor Kornberg. I'm a little bit nervous, so no, my voice please. might shake. Not only should you not be nervous, <laughs> but I, you really must feel free to ask anything. Okay, okay. And I'm happy and now to answer. I, I'm starting. 
so in Sweden in 2014, I watched your speech, and um, I and you mentioned that your concern of young researcher, and arguing that they are too old to be independent, they are too old to be original. Yeah, and um, so do you think it is still a serious problem in China or in the world? And how can we, uh, young researchers, and how can uh, the professors do to solve the problems? Thank you. So it's a very important question, and it is a major problem. And I'll just explain so everyone else understands the context and the reason why you have asked. It is indeed true that your best opportunity to be original and to discover something is in your teens, 20s, perhaps early 30s. Uh, and for reasons that I can't be very precise and explain, but I indicated in my remarks to you earlier, uh, the, uh, that capacity goes away. Uh, and, and, and again, I think it's because you know too much, not because you know too little. Uh, the, the problem that you allude to, of course, goes beyond that. And it is one of an, in, of, of an increasing uh, level of concern in, everywhere in the world, in the United States, in Europe, in China. So I'll first give you the example in the United States. It used to be during the time when I was a student, it was quite straightforward. You spent four years in university. You would spend four years doing graduate study and two years doing postdoctoral study. Well, the average person during that period, uh, a total of 10 years, would be 28 years old when they finished. They would uh, apply for a position at, uh, on a faculty at a university that time, at least, when everything there was, every university was expanding, there would always be a place. They would go at age 28, start an independent career, and uh, receive government support to perform a search. Today, the average age for gaining such independence is over 40 in the United States. By that time, you are, for the most part, very likely too old to be original. Uh, the problem occurs also in Europe and in China. It may take a slightly different form. Uh, a young person may become an assistant professor, but very often they do not have intellectual freedom. They are required as an assistant professor to serve like a kind of glorified postdoctoral fellow and do research that is required by a more senior professor. That kind of uh, hierarchical structure, very common in Germany, even to the present day, uh, and uh, often true in Chinese universities, is a serious impediment uh, to uh, the growth of science, the advance of science, and the best interests of the young people. The World Laureates Association is undertaking a, a unique initiative to address the problem. We are with at the uh, initiative and with the important support and guidance of Mr. Wu Shandong, building a laboratory that will house a thousand young scientists, divided in 200 research groups, everyone led by a junior principal investigator who may be 28, 30 years old, who is given an opportunity for early independence. They will have the opportunity in that laboratory of doing what they may not find wherever they may come from in the world. They will be selected, obviously, on the basis of merit from all around the world. We hope that we anticipate many will come from the US and Europe, and many, half or more, probably from China. It's a partial solution to the problem, but one way to address it. And uh, that laboratory is uh, starting soon, and in a few years it will, I hope, be fully occupied by some of the brightest young people in the world, given an opportunity for early independence. Thank you for your answer. Uh, any more questions?
Please feel free to raise your hand. Thank you. I was touched by your informative lecture. And um, during the pandemic, COVID-19, um, mRNA vaccines were widely spread and prevented uh, many dise uh, diseases from millions of people. And um, they are still facing some challenges, such as degradation and instability and so on. And uh, there are some researchers on these aspects. I would like to know how you see this uh, these challenges and um, how do you uh, think uh, researchers can think of scientific ways to solve these challenges? Thanks. You couldn't know how directly related that is to something I do. <laughs> Uh, something which I have brought to China on this visit to pursue with colleagues here. So uh, I'll frame it in a slightly different way. I mean, the problem that you have posed, the question you've asked about instability and other deficiencies or limitations of messenger RNA delivery uh, has been solved by uh, a group in Israel and I lead now that effort uh, and the application of the solution they found to this problem. I, can ex I will try to explain it very briefly. I were past the time, so I, you'll forgive me. Uh, but uh, the uh, solution that they have found is a method for the direct delivery, highly efficient and very rapid, of even very large molecules, such as RNA, also DNA, also proteins, to human cells. Uh, you understand the reason why the messenger RNA vaccines are uh, formulated in the way that they do and suffer all the limitations. There is really no direct method for their delivery to human cells. So one relies on chance if they are injected then sometimes they may be absorbed, most of the time not. A lot of material is required. It's slow, highly inefficient, and isn't readily applied to very many other examples of DNA and RNA that could have extraordinary therapeutic benefits. Well, the method uh, that was discovered in Israel is extremely simple, and it consists of a chemical modification of a DNA or an RNA or protein with almost a magical consequence. The molecules pass freely through biological membranes. We begin, in the first example, we are using it for delivery of what are called small interfering RNAs. These are short lengths of RNA which have uh, the effect of entering a natural mechanism for targeting and destruction of a messenger RNA with a similar sequence. Actually, the same, but a complementary sequence. And we have shown that if, for example, uh, we make such a small interfering RNA with a sequence complementary to SARS-CoV-2, we introduce the modification that I have mentioned, it will enter human cells, I should say mammalian cells. The, the trials have been done on non-human primates, but they will enter cells rapidly, efficiently, and in block the development of viral infection 99.9% effectively. You know, vaccines in the best cases with a vast amount of material, maybe 90%, but many times less, and other molecules also cannot be efficiently delivered. 99.9%. And not only that, they will not only cure an infection, which they do, but they will prevent infection. They, can, they are stable at room temperature. They can even be dried. They can be inhaled. It's not necessary to inject them. And they will protect an individual for many, many weeks against infection. Now, because this is a programmable or a digital drug, it's only the sequence of nucleotides that matters, one can immediately at this time make such a drug for every virus. Now, we have shown that it's effective for SARS-CoV-2, 
but we know that it will be equally effective for every other virus. So the group which I lead there has the mission of eliminating all human viral respiratory disease. 75% of the time when people come into a doctor's office in any place in the world, they complain about respiratory symptoms. Most of the time caused by a virus. There are 20 common human respiratory viruses. We have the capacity to change that world. There need be no more respiratory virus infection anywhere in the world. Thank you so much for your wonderful answer and your reasoning. So this is about to the end. And any more questions? This will be the last one. Professor, uh, I have a question that the alpha fold has been reported that it can predict the structure of protein accurately. Do you trust the results and would you like to give some comments about the function of AI in the structure biology research? That's yes. All. A very good question like all of those that have been asked. And some people here may know about AlphaFold, which is the AI-based uh, program to which you refer developed uh, by Google. And indeed, it is very important, and the results are very valuable to us, and we now exploit them in our research all the time. So very often, we can solve a structure nowadays not for the most part by X-ray crystallography, but usually by cryo-electron microscope analysis. And the quality of the information is not sufficient to determine the location of every atom. But if we now uh, compare the results of predictions by AlphaFold with what we observe, in many cases, we can arrive at a good model of the molecule in that way. There are many times when you can't, but it's extremely important when it can be done. Uh, AI, of course, can have very many other applications, and I'll just answer the, the question in a different way uh, that will uh, illustrate uh, another, another uh, benefit of AI. So the problem with AlphaFold, uh, it is not a, a method of determining structure. It is a method of uh, predicting structure based on all those that have been previously determined. There is a vast database of protein structures that have been accumulated by X-ray crystallography over the years. And AlphaFold searches that database for sequences similar to those that you are trying to solve now and can, build a, can discover matches and then assemble a structure based on that known information. Uh, the problem is that in the first place, it is not always applicable, uh, as I have mentioned. But beyond that, it doesn't go to the really next important question. Uh, let us suppose you want to develop a small molecule drug against a target protein. Well, AlphaFold can show you the structure of that protein. But it cannot show you the structure with the uh, potential small molecule. You may have a, a collection of many possible drugs. You can't tell from AlphaFold which is better or worse. For that, you require fundamental physics, uh, quantum chemistry. Another one of the groups with which I have worked, which I have led in California for now uh, probably 12, 13 years, has solved that problem. And we can perform, for the first time, accurate quantum mechanical calculations of the interaction of a drug candidate with a target protein structure. We use AlphaFold very often to help us identify that protein structure. But then we must go to quantum mechanics to compute the energy of interaction of one or another molecule with that structure. Now, we can uh, com make such a computation with reasonable accuracy. Uh, if you, in the language of 
chemistry, a half kilocalorie per mole, which is thermal energy. That's pretty good. If, however, we, in addition, create a library of quantum calculations, and I won't have time to explain in detail, 50,000 separate quantum calculations of individual atom-atom interactions and use an additional machine learning component to the analysis, we can improve the accuracy to 0 0.05 kilocalories per mole and get an absolutely reliable, highly accurate result and decide whether this molecule is a candidate for a drug or a, for a next step in design or not. We can replace chemical synthesis and testing with computation. We can do drug development much, much faster, and we can do it much better because we can now examine a far larger chemical space of drug candidates. And that's something which is being done right now in California and actually also in a laboratory we have in uh, Russia and another laboratory that we have in Israel. So thank you for the very interesting question and the thought provoking answer. Uh, And please accept the sincere gratitude from our students. Oh. Thank you so much.